Welcome um, to the Lansing Art Gallery and Education Center. Um, we're really excited to have this special exhibit here that um, we're hosting for Creativity in the Time of COVID project that you'll learn more about. Um, I see a lot of new faces here, so just a little background. We're a nonprofit agency. We've been here, not in this building, but around Lansing since 1965. Um, we offer exhibitions. We have a retail gallery over here. If you enjoy any of these art pieces that are made by Michigan artists, they're for purchase. Um, we have a lease purchase program, so if it seems like it's too much, you can do payment plan. Um, and this work is not for sale, it's just for your enjoyment. But we're gonna learn about it in a minute from the artist who's visiting. Also upstairs in our student gallery, there's student artwork that you can view. We also have really good snacks and some mock cocktails. So please go up there and enjoy after the talk. Um, there's restrooms out in the hall, both down here and upstairs if you need to use that. Um, also, I just wanted to let you know that there are some fishing line that is strung to the wall that you cannot see, which makes the artwork look really nice, but you have to be very aware and not to walk through it. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to introduce Nancy DeJoy, who's the brain power behind this wonderful exhibition that's happening in five spaces throughout the city in conjunction with the Capital City Film Fest. So I want to thank her for including us. And I want to thank all the people with the Capital City Film Festival that helped us install this wonderful work. And um, all of you for coming tonight. And if I don't know you, please, after the talk, please come up and say hello to me. And I'd like to learn more about you. So. Nancy, would you like to take sure. the floor? Um, and this is Rebecca. She's our interpreter tonight for ASL. So um, she will be at all the events that are happening with this exhibition around town. Um, there's a website where you can learn more information about it, which Nancy will tell you what that is. <laughs> Nancy. It's just a mic. I have a loud voice normally, but I'm a little tired today, so I'll use this. Um, before we got, get started, I want to introduce one more person, um, Fatima Kanari, who is my co-curator, um, and without whom none of this would be happening. Period. <laughs> um, this exhibit is part of a project called Creativity in the Time of COVID-19 art for equity and social justice. We have art um, here and at four other venues, Impression 5, the Refugee Development Center, hmm. our, uh, what, what am I missing? The, the Sears. Our big exhibit is at the Sears building. We have over 200 pieces um, of art there from people from all seven continents. Oh, and Refugee Development Center. Reach. 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 Thank you. We have art um, up there too. All of those open on April 5th. Uh, we will have a big party on April 6th in conjunction with the beginning of the Capital City Film Festival. And if you've ever been, you know it's a big party and it's a dress up party if you want it to be. People get very <laughs> dressed up. Um, there'll be bars and music and a DJ and um, a lot of a lot of things going on there on the 6th of April um, and then again on our closing event for the film festival at April 15th the exhibit goes till the end of the month um, I want to take a minute to introduce um, Sukhan Yamani to you to all of you she's the artist responsible um, for all the paperwork on the beautiful shadows that you're seeing right now Sukhan Yamani is a St. Louis-based, Indian-born, interdisciplinary artist. Her artistic process is a practice of sustained curiosity and constant learning through asking questions. 
the artwork results from pursuing inquiry born out of a community-based, research-driven process. Each project begins with discovering a core idea around which she builds the work. She then experiences, experiments with various media to find the best fit to, look, to deliver this core idea to its intended audience. Transforming the violent act of cutting into an act of creation is central to her artistic approach. Tran uh, her process involves creating clusters of undulating forms by warping, cutting, manipulating, and installing paper and found materials. Her installations transform public space into places of interventions by creating grounding and contemplative experiences for the viewer. Each exhibit brings together a site-specific, immersive, multi-part installation that is organized by visual complexity and relationship of individual elements to each other. Large and small representative and abstract symbols establish a progression to encourage the exploration of patterns, forms, and overall theme that she considers throughout her work. Stories, conversations, reading, and listening enter into her artwork, which may or may not be recognized by the viewer. This is done with the motive of creating an immersive environment for the viewer to enter and explore. Her work is part of our larger Lansing exhibit. And you can see more of her work, including a major installation at the former Sears building starting on April 5th. I w I'd like to take a minute to thank the people at the Lansing Art Gallery and Education Center for their generosity, their patience, because the install happened in stages instead of all in one day, and for everything that they've offered us and all of their kindness. I have had the pleasure of spending time with Sukanya these past few days. Her spirit and the natural way that she cares for everyone involved with her work, from installers to gallery personnel and community curators is a gift we have all experienced. Please join me in welcoming her to the Lansing Art Gallery and Education Center. So we're gonna start with a couple questions um, for Sukanya and then you'll have time um, to ask some questions um, as well. First question here is what stimulates your creativity? During the time of COVID or all the time? <laughs> or both. Or both. Um, I have always been a creative person. I think I was born an artist. Um, ever since I can remember, I've been drawing and sketching and coming up with ideas. Um, I grew up in India and um, I studied science not art. <laughs> Chemistry. <laughs> um, I came to the United States in 98 on a dependent visa. And so for the next couple of years, I didn't have a work permit. And that allowed me, gave me the space to explore what I really wanted to do with my life. And I always wanted to be an artist. And so I started to develop that craft. And the idea of creativity is not to create anything, but to even think differently, right? And that's what I think has been the biggest journey for me. It's not to create work, but to think differently. And then find a way to take what I have thought and present it to you. And during COVID was a specific, mm -hmm. uh, it was a drive. The you know, creative process was very different during COVID. And that's why I think I applied for this show. And I have to thank Nancy and Fatima for everything that you have done. Thank you for putting this wonderful show together and for giving artists the chance to think about what COVID meant for us. But um, we were cut off, right? As human beings, we were cut off from each other. We were cut off from our future. 
It was not like we knew one year, two years, it'll be okay. We didn't know what was going to happen. So uh, we all dealt with it differently, and the way I dealt with it was through creating work and telling stories. Great. And so what inspires your work, and how do you stay motivated? Um, it's a compulsion. <laughs> I am constantly drawing in my sketchbooks. So everything that you see has always already been sketched out in different permutations and combinations. It's only when I have some ideas in my head on how it would look that I start to cut things. Um, to stay motivated is, for me, is the compulsion to tell stories. And the more these stories need to be told, the more I feel like, okay, this is a subject that I want to tell the world. That's what drives me more than anything else. And can you talk a little bit about those main subjects? Yes. So going back to when COVID hit, I'd like to share a small story, if you don't mind. This was in May, I think in May, when you know we had all just realized that COVID is here to stay. It's not a one week, two week thing. We don't know what is going on in the world. It was not just us, it was the entire world. And I remember sitting down in my living room and just, I, was, I burst into tears. I was feeling helpless and agitated. I have uh, two children and I was worried about them. I was worried about my parents who are in India. Um, and I did like a gratitude prayer, something to calm myself after some time. I said, well, at least there's a roof over my head. I have food on my table. I have my family, you know, things that we say to feel better. So that's what I did. I fell asleep. The very next day, I read a news article about victims and survivors of domestic violence and abuse. And it was like a slap on my face. The very thing that I told myself, look how lucky I am, I have this roof and I, I'm surrounded by these people. That thing that gave me that strength is what was a prison for some people. And at that time I was not thinking art project, none of that. I was just really disturbed. And I started doing some research. Um, since I'm an immigrant, I put put myself in those shoes. That's how we empathize, is when you put yourself in someone else's shoes. And I remembered coming to this country with no driver's license, no money, no job, no bank account, nothing. And it's such a vulnerable position to be in. And so that's where the journey of domestic violence awareness started. And the work that I have been creating since um, COVID-19 is to bring awareness about domestic and sexual violence, uh, highlighting the immigrant and refugee community. Yes. And you can see a, a, a very focused um, installation um, on these issues at the Sears building um, as well. What do you want viewers to learn from your work? Can I talk a little bit about each the individual piece? That'd piece? be great. Yeah. yeah, that'd be fantastic. Perfect. So this piece that you see up here, it's called Spir The Spirituality of Flight. It was born um, after I read a book called Women Who Fly. It was a very interesting book about women and sexuality and how in different cultures and mythologies, um, there are the Valkyrie in um, Nordic culture and then there are uh, women goddesses in Egypt with bird faces, and there are uh, apsaras in the Indian mythology. These are beautiful women who descend from heaven, and they uh, have sex on earth, and then they leave again. And it was a very interesting way of looking at women. And the entire fable, all of these stories, were about how men would keep these women here and not let them go back, right? So it was. So while I was reading it, again, it brought back the idea of how are women kept in a specific place, right? How are they not allowed to leave? Um, and I wanted to bring in the idea of the butterfly because they say that if you touch a butterfly's wing, it dies. It's so delicate and it's so soft. 
and equating that to a woman's vir virtue in, in ancient stories. So those are some of the things that I was reading and listening to when I cut that piece. And I wanted to make it big and powerful, and I wanted people to walk around it and light it up um, so that you can see specific shadows. Um, and that you would see in a lot of my work. This particular piece was born out of a, a transcript of a woman who was living in a domestic violence abusive situation. Uh, she stayed with this abuser for almost close to eight or nine years because she had four younger sisters who had to get married. And she knew that if she left this relationship or if she got divorced, that her sisters would be tainted by it and would not be able to find spouses. So I wanted to show the idea of the cultural um, barriers, some extra barriers that immigrant and refugee women face. Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk about a few pieces. I don't want to take too much time, but if you talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here. Okay. Uh, so this piece is called At the Edge of Ignorance. And the idea behind it is both ignorance and knowledge. I, I visualize them as circles. And as our wisdom increases, so does our perimeter of our ignorance, right? We only know so much, and then we find out how much we don't know. So that can be true with any subject, but I kind of wanted to play with that idea in this piece. Um, so I use Tyvek, which is a kind of a, it's, a, it's between paper and fabric. It's a um, produced material, it's recyclable. It's used in construction to put around houses. Um, I paint it and then I hand cut. Everything is hand cut and then the cutting process is very structured, very focused, and the installation process is very open, very much out of my control. Mm -hmm. But I enjoy both sides of the creation of this work. Um, yes, we had to bring a scissor lift in which literally had a half an inch on each side coming out of the wall. So you can imagine how much fun that was, right? Um, so are you hoping to raise awareness? Is there uh, anything else related to the idea of creativity and awareness that you want to talk a little bit about? Sure. The, what I'm working on currently is about domestic violence. And that I see in three stages. The first step is to raise awareness through creating art, displaying it, and through educational programs like workshops. I'm doing some specific workshops with uh, college and high school students because we want to talk to younger people about what does abuse mean, what's OK, not OK in relationships, and so on. The second part of it is action, right? I have a website sukanyamoney.com and in my website I have um, different places that you can go to. You can go to a place if you want to volunteer. You can go click on some links if you want to donate and if you need help or if you know somebody who needs help, I have resources there as well. So that's the second step is to have something that you can actually, that there is an actionable item there. And the third part is to take this actionable item and the awareness and then create or change policy. Because that is when real change will affect these women, these men, and the LGBTQ people who are living within domestic violence situations. Um, and then, I think we talked about it in our workshop earlier, the goal is to eradicate. Why not dream big, right? <laughs> but we can do it, we can all do it together. Thank you, Sukanya. I'm going to ask if the audience has any questions for you. Sure. Any questions for Sukanya from our audience? Great. Do you, do you name your pieces? Yes. So yes. the ones that you described, what are their names? What are their names or so this is, uh, I think we have the names here. We do. Right here. Yeah, thank you. So the black pieces are called Parallax. This is spirituality of flight, and she who walks together. 
and at the edge of ignorance. That is a whole um, difficulty in itself, naming the pieces. <laughs> Just one follow-up. Um, you had mentioned that this is, uh, this content started in COVID. What are some of the other themes historically have you have you kind of covered across time? I have worked with um, a lot of gender issues even before COVID. Just uh, trying to understand um, women, where we are from, how we are portrayed in mythology, in current social economic conditions. I also have a deep interest in science and cosmology, so there is some of that that creeps in as well. But it also ties in as to how women are educated and why sometimes women are not able to go into science and technology and math. So there's a lot going on. <laughs> but that's what I do is I go through these phases of a couple of years of working on one particular piece or one particular core idea and then I work on pieces around it. And then I will go over to a different idea. And I keep going back and forth between mostly gender-related um, artwork. And is there a new theme emerging? The new theme is still about domestic That's violence. Right. That's where I'm at. I am also working on uh, including some technology into my work. Uh, this year's building, I have three prototypes that are um, uh, motion sensor. So they are paper cuts within frames with um, domestic violence brochures and visas behind it. And when a viewer walks close to it, it lights up. Because I wanted to convey the idea of how our presence is what is going to change, our awareness. The reg everybody here, all of the people that we know, we are the ones who are going to make the change happen. So I am looking at bringing in, yeah. And I was just talking earlier today, I want to make a giant spider web. <laughs> and then think about how to install it. <laughs> the installation was amazing. Charles, you have a question. Do you, are you familiar with the book Cutting for Stone? I am not. Then I won't ask my question. <laughs> But you will be now. <laughs> I will be set up for sure. So you talked a little bit about your education. Did you have any formal art training, or are you pretty much self-taught? No art training, like wow. zero art training. Yeah. In the sense, not a music so class, no dance class, no art class, nothing. Uh, so my dad was just to give you context. Not everybody in India grows up with no arts education, right. <laughs> but my dad was in the uh, armed forces, so we moved every two years, and you know the, the schools that we went to did not have any arts education. Good for you. <laughs> I, think school, I think a lot of schools ruin people. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Isaac. What is it about the paper cutting medium that you thought? Um, made it really well suited to tell the story of gender-based violence and domestic violence? That's, that's a great question. It, it was, to begin with, I, I was a struggling artist. I didn't have a job. And so I used paper because it was available and cheap. <laughs> um, but then also, I did not want to, I did not want to keep the stories behind a frame. I kind of wanted them to be have an immediate effect. And I love the idea of installations. And installing something heavy is going to be super expensive. So this is sorry, practical answer, but that's how it started. But I have started to incorporate not just Tyvek, but also, like I said, the visa papers that women have to fill out, uh, which could take up to seven to 10 years for them to be able to work. How do you? move from a abusive situation if you cannot work for at least seven years. So anyway, and also promotional brochures and also um, translated materials. There's so much that's lost in translation with you know the resources that are available by the time it gets to women who hardly speak any English. Um, so those papers had like a, it, there was a very strong calling to that, to that text. Um, so paper just seems like it just fits into this um, theme very well. 
The other thing that I thought of was paper can, you know, paper is so delicate. Once you crumple it, it never goes back to its old pristine self. And that also happens with abuse. You know, it's, I mean, you can heal, but it's so hard to get back to where people were. And mental trauma is another thing that that particular part um, emphasizes. We have another question here. You touched on it just at the end. I, I'm um, always curious about how things are made. This is so elegant, so fragile, so gentle, whatever it is. I was trying to figure out how do you cut something, tiny holes, holes, shapes, without tearing the paper or having the paper curve on your arm. I, just, I can't imagine how you do this. You see 10% of my work. 90% <laughs> of my work are just, you know, I was just telling, I don't remember who I told this to, I sneezed and accidentally <laughs> cut an entire piece that had oh, to be no. thrown off. Yeah. Unfortunately, this medium has a no, it's not forgiving at all. But um, just to give you a, an idea of the process, it all starts in my head. What is it that I want to say? And then a lot of sketches and drawings and some compositions. But then, for example, when I was cutting this piece, I wanted it to be a butterfly, but I didn't want it to be perfectly symmetrical. So I very rarely draw it out and cut it. I might do some outlines just to see where I need to stop. But everything that goes in is it's a very organic process. It's the music that I'm listening to. It's the audio books that kind of lead my hand in. And another practical thing that I do is, which I have learned after years of experience, is to keep it the Pomodoro method. Has anybody heard of that? It's a 25 minute timer that you keep on your phone mm -hmm. uh, so that you are fully focused and engaged. And at the end of 25 minutes, I keep my um, X-Acto knife down and I walk away because I tend to make mistakes if I'm just going. You know, it's very hard on your eyes very hard on your hands and your neck and shoulders, especially a piece like this is laid on the floor and then cut. I cut it all by hand, so it, yeah. So it it's, is, it's an exacto knife. I heard, the, I, I, I heard the tool. Yes, it is an exacto knife. I see. It's amazing. Thank you. How do you keep them sharp? I change them, I would say, every two to three days. I have to right. take a new knife. So, so talk a little bit more about the physicality of what you do. Sure. Um, so once I have an idea of what I want to do, I usually will have two or three different pieces together. Because again, it's so hard on my hands that if I continue to do one kind of cut, it, it really you know, is hard on my hand and my wrists. So I'll alternate between different kinds of cuts. Um, and I have grown very focused. The time that I'm cutting, I don't want to be disturbed. I, I'm, my studio is in my basement at my home, but I just lock the door. I have a puppy and kids, and everybody's sent out. Uh, and um, the bigger pieces are the most, um, not scary, but a um, little blood pressure. <laughs> um, because there's so much at stake, right? Yeah. Like it's not. But what I started to do is I've started to free myself of that and say the worst thing that can happen is I can't use it and I'll use something else. Um, because otherwise you will never start anything, right? Like right. you have to have that attitude. But so, so, so can you work with both hands? No. Okay. I'm a right-handed uh, person. But um, like I said, I keep stopping in the middle and I keep changing out the, the position that I'm in, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. on the floor or sometimes on the tables. But the bigger pieces, I don't have too much control. I have to, you know, keep it on the floor and work. And it's also really important for the paper not to snag on something or get dirty. Uh, I also spray paint some of the pieces so that it just gives like one thin more layer of body. So every time I do an installation, I take it down and I wipe it with like a Swiffer cloth or something, and then I will give it a spray just to kind of freshen it. Keep it, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I have 
question for you, Sakanya. Does your education background in chemistry influence your art at all? Yes. Um, more than specifically chemistry, it's the way the brain is wired to think about things. Because I, I think I'm a scientist at heart in that I do multiple iterations and I do experimentations and, um, and you constantly keep changing the tools that you're using. Um, so it's more, um, I think science is so important because it, science and math, because it kind of teaches us on how to objectively look at something. Now art is subjective, um, but you have to use some of the objective tools to get there, right? You still have to make it work, right? For example, if I take a piece of paper and cut through it, com like really completely cut through it, it has no body to support an installation. Like you can see some of these pieces are already so delicate that they are falling in. Um, but if I cut any more, then they cannot even support themselves. So to understand that, um, there, I think I use a lot of my scientific background with that. Does that yeah. help answer the question? Thank you. So what advice would you give people to inspire their creative expression? That's a very difficult question. <laughs> we have ta I, we have ta we've talked about this a little bit. So I'm also the poet in residence for Capital City Film Festival, and I have, um, like the art that you see, you'll see um, at Sears, many of the people who submitted are, are not artists. They are people who were using creativity to express um, trauma or fear during COVID or, or you know, joy of of being able to help others or stuff, uh, there by doctors and so on. And uh, some of the poets that work with me haven't uh, ever read any of their work out loud before or thought about it as a finished thing that was going to be in our in our Capital City Film Poetry book. And so I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, what advice uh, would you have if, if somebody's standing out here saying, I think that could doing something creative might uh, resonate with my life. Yeah, I think you just need to unleash your inner child. You know, when take you, yourself back to when you were very young, <coughs> you would have been fearless. You, you're given a piece of paper and markers. <coughs> you would have done whatever you wanted to do. And you know, if it doesn't work, you don't like it, you pick up another piece of paper and work on it. Don't think about the end result. You know, a walk can be a creative process, right? It's, it's about how you think and how you use those neurons in your brain to figure out the problems in your life. That is creativity. But I would say, you know, I would highly recommend for everybody to pick up a craft, any craft, you know, because it just, there is a sense of meditative calming with paper cutting. It, it, it's a very calming experience. Um, knitting, sewing, uh, photography, you know. And I <coughs> promise you don't have to show it to a single person. Right. Just do it for yourself and do it as a community. Sometimes I've seen people come together, work on things, and you don't have to show it to anybody. But do it for yourself. It's, it's so, um, for me, it's a profession. So I have, <laughs> I have some. Uh, stress involved within it, but if I don't have to show any of my work anywhere, I would I would be doing it all the time. Um, yeah, I hope that helps. Any <laughs> final questions for Well, I just want to say again what, what an absolute joy and pleasure it's been. Um, to get to know you in person, because we did a lot of Zoom. And I want to thank you for all the support you've given me this week. Um, as you might imagine, I'm in a pretty stressful situation as well. And this has changed my whole um, ability to feel joy. Oh, all this work is going on. So thank you so much, Sukanya. And I will give you another round of applause. Thank you so much.
is going to be here to talk with you. There's um, mocktails and food upstairs, so please hang out. Thank you. Thank you.